There was a time long ago when the dominant creatures on the planet were dinosaurs. If you accept that modern man has been around for about 200,000 years, then the dinosaurs were around for 1,000 times longer. But then they weren't. There were many other creatures that disappeared at the same time as the dinosaurs. It has been estimated that 90% of all marine species vanished at the same time as the dinosaurs, and 50% of all life on Earth. Ammonites had been around for 300 million years, and then they weren't. But Spielberg was never asked to make a film about ammonites, so this video will look at the extinction of the dinosaurs. By this, of course, I mean non-avian dinosaurs. When did we learn about dinosaurs? When did they become extinct? How did they become extinct? How do we know when and how they became extinct? As always, when discussing science, what is known means what the best evidence of observation, testing and successful prediction shows to be the truth. Science is always open to new evidence once that evidence is proven. First, a brief history of dinosaur fossil hunting. Dinosaur fossils, as with the remains of other extinct megafauna, are part of human history. Fossilised bones and fossilised tracks have always been found by humans, but they get little direct mention. History is selective in what it records, but it's no big stretch to think that many of the ancient myths of giants, dragons and monsters were in part coloured by the discovery of the odd fossilised dinosaur bone or the uncovering of fossilised dinosaur tracts. The ancient Greeks, such as Pythagoras, Xenophanes, Thales and Aristotle, considered the origin of fossils from a naturalistic viewpoint. But Christianity, with its young earth creation and flood myths, made the idea of an old earth unthinkable, or perhaps unmentionable, for the next 2,000 years. Leonardo da Vinci did write about fossils, however he never published his work, and so little is known of its influence. Robert Hooke discussed ideas about fossilization in his 1664 Micrographia, where he is dismissive of Francesco Stelluti's idea that certain clays turned into wood and suggested rather that buried wood might, over time, have its pores filled with mineral juices. Nicholas Steno was a Danish Catholic bishop, and his 1669 publication concerning a solid body enclosed by process of nature within a solid starts to formulate ideas about rock stratigraphy and fossilization, but Steiner was shackled to Usher's biblical chronology, which forced him to draw many wrong conclusions, such as that mammoth fossils dug up in the Arno Valley in Italy were remains of Hannibal's elephant army. Robert Plot probably detailed the first identifiable dinosaur fossil, though of course he didn't identify it. In his 1677 book, he discussed a fossil which had been found in a shallow limestone quarry in Cornwell, which is near Chipping Norton. His book mentions several ideas bouncing around at that time concerning fossilization. Some thought fossils were the result of rock crystals developing into coincidentally familiar looking shapes, some that they were the remains of once living animals, and some thought they were perhaps the seeds of animals and plants which had been washed into the ground and germinated there somehow. Plot seems to have been of the opinion that fossils of shells in particular, but also most other fossils which appeared similar to living creatures or animal parts, were indeed simply rock crystals taking on seemingly familiar shapes. But some he could not explain away. In particular was this one which very closely resembled part of a human thigh bone, though gigantic in proportion. Plot considered the possibility that it might be from an elephant brought over by the Romans during Claudius' invasion of Britain in 43 CE, as was detailed in Dio's Roman history. But Plot was then able to observe an actual elephant which had been brought to Oxford, and he concluded that the fossil could not be from an elephant's leg. He then made the leap to deciding that the fossil must be from a human male or female, but one of gigantic size, as he had read about in the Bible, Greek myths and other stories. Superstition takes a long time to fade. Plot had indeed found a fossil, 
And whilst the specimen is lost to history, paleontologists are confident from Plot's illustration and the description which genus this leg bone belonged to. Fortunately, for all parents who have to explain the Latin names of dinosaurs to their inquiring offspring, when this, the first ever genus of dinosaur, was finally named by William Buckland in 1827, he most likely did not connect it to Plot's fossil, or perhaps did, but decided to ignore the name given by Richard Brooks when he redescribed Plot's fossil in 1763. Instead, Buckland went with Megalosaurus. The word dinosaur itself was not coined by Sir Richard Owen until 1842. In 1852, Benjamin Waterhouse Hawkins was commissioned to recreate dinosaurs for the Crystal Palace when it was relocated from Hyde Park to Penge Hill. His Megalosaurus is still there along with his other efforts, though modern ideas of what Megalosaurus looked like are somewhat different. Now as the game of digging for dinosaur fossils progressed, it became apparent that these fossils appeared in certain strata only. Above a certain point in the rock strata, there were no dinosaur fossils. The boundary between fossils and no fossils is commonly known as the KPG boundary. It used to be the KT boundary, but we have to stay up to date. This boundary is marked worldwide by a thin layer of sediment. The KPG extinction event is one of a number of significant extinction events throughout history, marked by a sudden absence of fossils for certain species in rock strata. Princeton University geologist Jen Jepsen observed in 1964 that authors of varying competence have suggested that dinosaurs disappeared because the climate deteriorated or because changes in the pressure or composition of the atmosphere, poison gases from volcanic dust, continental drift, extraction of the moon from the Pacific Basin or even lack of standing room in Noah's Ark. This should serve as a reminder of how young Earth science is. But let's move on and enter stage left Louis Alvarez. Alvarez is described by the American Journal of Physics as one of the most brilliant and productive experimental physicists of the 20th century. We catch up with Louis in the late 1970s. His son Walter a geologist working on the Umbrian Apennines in Italy, had explained to Louis that the KPG boundary was a mystery. Below it were the dinosaurs, above it were none. Now Louis, with his background, carried out an analysis of the material within the KPG boundary. He then published a paper in 1980, in which he stated that the material sampled from the KPG boundary indicated that the Earth had suffered an impact by an asteroid of about 10 kilometers diameter 65 million years ago. He had started with the knowledge that metals like platinum, iridium, osmium and rhodium are much less abundant in the Earth crust than they are in meteorites. The hypothesis is that, like other heavy elements, these concentrated towards the Earth's core during the early molten phase. Alvarez and his team decided to measure the abundance of 28 elements in the sample, chosen because they suited the test method. The results showed that iridium levels at the KPG boundary spiked by a factor of 30 over background levels. OK for Italy, Alvarez then performed the same tests on a sample of clay taken from the KPG boundary found in cliffs 50 kilometers south of Copenhagen. The results showed that iridium levels at that boundary in Denmark spiked by a factor of 160 over background levels. The paper also mentions work on the boundary layer in New Zealand, which showed a factor 20 increase in iridium levels. The team did consider whether the layer could have been of terrestrial origin, but the levels of the other elements present didn't add up. They further considered the possibility that an exploding supernova might be responsible for the sudden influx of heavy elements into Earth's atmosphere. However, the conclusions of the paper were that the KPG boundary was the result of an asteroid impact, that the crater, with a two-thirds chance of being under the ocean, was unlikely ever to be found. Within a year of the paper's issue, iridium enrichment had been detected in more than 100 KPG boundary layers around the world. Paleontologists and paleobotanists did continue to argue for a gradual extinction event. Paleontologists thought at the time that the fossil record supported a more gradual extinction, and paleobotanists did not think the idea of a catastrophic extinction matched their fossil record either. Criticism of Alvarez also came from geologists, some of whom argued that the iridium spikes were of terrestrial, volcanic origin. 
They saw the Deccan Flats as both the source of the iridium spike and the cause of the KPG boundary extinction event. However, the geology of the Deccan Traps shows the same iridium spike at the KPG boundary and the suggested elevated iridium resulting from volcanic action is absent. Now, coincidentally, at the same time Alvarez was producing his original paper, Glenn Penfield was carrying out geophys work for the Mexican state-owned oil company Pemex. Penfield was struck by an extraordinarily symmetrical 40-mile diameter underwater arc visible from the airborne magnetic survey data. He then obtained a gravity map of the area created in the 1960s and saw the same feature. Now, Penfield was unable to publicize his findings because he was tied up by corporate policy. He later discovered another arc feature on the land itself, and this extended the feature to 110 miles in diameter. In 1990, a reporter put Penfield in touch with Alan Hildebrand. Hildebrand had published a 1981 paper on an Earth impact hypothesis based on iridium levels, shocked quartz and tectites, in which he very tentatively suggested an eastern Pacific impact site based on the material composition of the boundary layer and a 120 mile crater that might be responsible for the distribution of the sediments he'd been looking at. Now, by the time Penfield and Hildebrand were put in touch, Hildebrand was looking for an impact site in the Caribbean. Following the discovery by Haitian professor Florentine Marais of what he thought of as evidence of an ancient Haitian volcano. So in 1991, Penfield and Hildebrand issued their paper. The evidence, when reviewed, seemed to provide incontrovertible evidence of a massive impact, and the controversy was pretty much settled. There had been a massive impact at Chicxulub 65 million years ago. It would have created an impact winter, dimming the sun and cooling the global temperature by around 2 degrees for a couple of years. It was responsible for the iridium at the KT boundary, or sorry, KPG boundary. It was the most likely candidate for a sudden mass extinction event, which called an end to the reign of the mighty dinosaurs. And the ammonites? Subsequent research has only strengthened Chicxulub in its candidature as killer of the dinos. Further core samples and improved imaging of the area now suggest a crater closer to 200 miles across. More recently, candidates for the source of the asteroid have been suggested. A cometary impact has been suggested. And with more possible impact craters of roughly the same age as Chicxulub being identified, the possibility of a multiple impact event has been suggested. The key paper here is 20 years after the original Penfield Hildebrand paper. This paper is the result of 41 experts from 33 institutions worldwide reviewing 20 years of data concerning paleontology, geochemistry, climate modelling, geophysics and sedimentology. Here's a summary of their findings. More than 350 KPG boundary sites are currently known. This is in 2010. And these sites show a distinct ejected distribution pattern related to distance from the Chicxulub crater. The pattern of decreasing ejector layer thickness with increasing distance from the impact crater is consistent with the Chicxulub event as the unique source for the ejector in the KPG boundary event deposit. Additional support for this genetic link derives from the distribution, composition and depositional mode of the ejector. First, the size and abundance of spherules and ballistically ejected shocked quartz grains, which are resistant to alteration, decrease with increasing distance from Chicxulub. The specific composition, e.g. silicate spherules, shocked limestone and dolomite and granitic clasts, and age distribution of the ejector, match the suite of Chicxulub target rocks. The presence of high energy clastic units at proximal KPG boundary sites intercalated between two layers rich in Chicxulub ejector suggests that the Chicxulub impact caused a collapse of the Yucatan carbonate platform and triggered mass flows and tsunamis in the Gulf of Mexico and adjacent areas. Therefore the KPG boundary clastic unit up to 80 meters thick in places was deposited in the extremely brief period between the arrival of coarse grain spherules and the subsequent longer term deposition of the finer grained PGE and NI rich ejector phases. That an impact large enough to generate the Chicxulub crater would induce earthquakes of magnitude greater than 11. 
that near-surface target material was ejected ballistically at velocities up to a few kilometers a second as part of the ejector curtain. This yielded the thick spheral layer at proximal sites and the basal spheral layer at intermediate distance sites. There are estimates of at least 100 to 500 gigatons of sulfur released nearly instantaneously. These figures are likely to be conservative, with the capacity to cool Earth's surface for years to decades by up to 10 degrees centigrade. The paper continues by detailing the paleobotany and paleobiology which supports the sudden extinction hypothesis, detailing the changes in flora and fauna at the KPG boundary, not only considering the vertebrate species but also down to plankton, fern spores and fungal spores. The paper concludes by stating that the Chicxulub impact was responsible for the mass extinction event around 65.5 million years ago. The multi-impact theories and volcanic theories fail to explain the distribution of the impact ejector, its composition or the abrupt extinctions. The only thing left to mention by me is that some dinosaur fossils do appear above the KT boundary. And this will be thrown at you by young earth creationists. But as yet no associated bones, i.e. more than one bone from the same dinosaur, has been found. And until that occurs it would be reasonable to assume that individual fossils found above the boundary are the result of reworking. That is fossils which have been washed or eroded from their original location and then re-stratified in later sedimentary layers. Okay, now that took longer than I thought. So what is the short version that your creationist friend might be able to get their head around? It is this. The young earth creationist maintains that all of the fossils in all of the rock strata were laid down during the year-long flood of Genesis. Okay? Well, before the meteor impacted at Chicxulub, there was already three kilometers, at least, of fossil-strewn sedimentary rock strata making up the Yucatan carbonate platform. The top of this strata has been identified at over 350 worldwide sites, that's 2010 figures, as representing the end of the Cretaceous period. The Chicxulub meteor then punched a hole through this 3K of rock strata. The debris from the impact created an impact event boundary layer in the strata that is visible worldwide. The impact caused global devastation. 90% of aquatic and 50% overall of species which exist below the KPG boundary layer do not exist above it. The non-avian dinosaurs, pterosaurs and ammonites disappear from the fossil record at the boundary. The very few Cretaceous fossils which appear above the boundary can be explained by reworking. Any significant find would make scientists rethink the extinction event. That's how science works. The strata layer above the impact event is called the Paleogene. The flora and fauna unique to the Paleogene are not found below the KPG boundary layer. None of the animals which evolved after Chicxulub exist in the strata below the KPG boundary layer. The peak of Mount Everest is Ordovician limestone. This is limestone which predates the Chicxulub impact and therefore contains no fossils found in post-KPG strata. And you might want to add that the Deepwater Horizon drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico is drilling 27,000 feet into tertiary strata to reach oil, which means that there is a layer of strata deeper than Everest is high sitting atop the KPG boundary in the Gulf of Mexico. When they've digested that, you can ask them to reconcile it with their Bible.